Hello everyone, and I'd first like to thank the organising committee for allowing me the uh, opportunity to talk to you about the, a day in, in, um, in the life of a clinical gynaecologist who um, I, I'd like to start with talking to you about, uh, about my own um, um, embryonic and fetal development as a gynaecologist because I had the extraordinary privilege of um, writing my PhD thesis between medical school and starting my um, uh, registrarship as a, as a gynaecologist. So I was actually undergoing my uh, embryonic and fetal development as a scientist and as a clinical doctor um, and I was instilled with um, the ideas of David's and uh, of course Tessa's and many other collaborators while I was uh, developing those skills and they have a, an effect each and every day in my um, in my ward round and I've tried to uh, mark this by in having a sort of imprint or an epigenetic mark on every slide <laughs> Which is, uh, which is by the Dutch famine. Okay, so I've, um, at the moment, my work consists mainly of clinical work because I'm, uh, I'm uh, subspecializing in fetal um, uh, maternal care. And um, I just randomly selected a number of patients that I've seen in the past couple of weeks. So I'm doing my morning rounds in the Academic Medical Center, which is the um, hospital that, um, <coughs> that uh, the Wilhelmina Gasthaus that Tessa just talked about has now become. And I, um, I saw Mrs. L.A. Uh, she's um, a gravid of two, so it's a second pregnancy and she's had one previous pregnancy. She's 31 years old and she's um, just been delivered at a gestational age of 28 weeks and two days. Her history is that she had a term pregnancy um, uh, four or five years earlier and she delivered a healthy young boy. He was 3,240 grams. And um, both pregnancies were ICSI pregnancies. And they were, ICSI is, uh, is, ICSI is, is uh, intracellular uh, intracytoplasmatic sperm injection. So it's IVF treatment. Um, and she underwent those treatments for unexplained infertility. So there was nothing wrong with her or her husband. And yet they were subfertile. They were unable to get pregnant. Um, the pregnancy that she's just been delivered of, she had severe intrauterine growth restriction and uh, mild preeclampsia. And she was delivered over the night of a, uh, a daughter of 725 grams by emergency C-section, which was indicated by fetal distress on um, CTG. And we're talking about what happened last night, and she asks me again and again, why did this happen? And she asked me, was it the ICSI, and I thought this was a brilliant question. She, she told me about how her ICSI procedures had gone. So the first, t she had, um, the first pregnancy she had as a, uh, a frozen embryo transfer, and she had a stimulation regimen. So in the IVF procedure, you undergo ovarian hyperstimulation, <coughs> and um, it differed slightly from the one she had in the subsequent pregnancy. Um, she also mentioned she had a day three transfer in the first pregnancy and had a day five transfer in the, sub in the, transfer in the subsequent one. And she asked me, is that the reason that this pregnancy has gone so dramatically differently f for me? And um, well, I, I thought it was a brilliant question. I, 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 we talked about this for a while. I said, well, we know about IVF and, and uh, short-term outcomes in terms of pregnancy. We know that there are far more twins and twins have a major impact on prematurity and growth restriction. But we also know that singletons conceived by IVF are more often born prematurely. They more often have a low birth weight and they have increased perinatal morbidity. We're um, also aware of uh, the fact that the few studies that have, stu that have looked at the long-term outcomes of IVF children they have higher blood pressure, more obesity, uh, impaired glucose tolerance, and um, there is an impact on other cardiovascular measures, including the, uh, su the, the shape of the heart and the function of the vessels. Um, what we don't know is which of the components of the artificial reproductive technology, um, in, the, in this case IVF, actually cause these or underlie these assumptions. Um, and we're currently in the process of trying to unravel 
the contribution <coughs> of the subfertility on the one hand and all of the components that make up the IVF procedure on the other hand. So there, the oxygen tension in the, in the uh, Petri dish while the, um, while the uh, embryo is being cultured and some other aspects that uh, you heard uh, Tom Fleming speak about earlier this morning. But what I think is particularly interesting in the sense that of the, 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 the clinical impact of this is that we've, we've also now, uh, we're seeing more and more IVF taking place. And um, as doctors, I think we have, um, the, um, we have the job of um, also keeping an eye on the uh, safety profile and the efficacy profile. So I've just talked to you about the safety profile of uh, of IVF where there is lots of reason to believe that if you have, uh, have undergone IVF there's a, a poorer outcome. This study has nothing to do with that. This study here is, is um, uh, the pregnancy, uh, the cumulative ongoing pregnancy rate for women that have got, undergone the green line of the IUI, the intrauterine um, uh, insemination, or the red line, the IVF treatment, and uh, the blue line are the women or the couples that have a spontaneous pregnancy. This is of a cohort of men and women or couples that have unexplained infertility. So what you see here is that there is possibly actually not really very much reason to think that you would have a higher likelihood of getting pregnant by IVF than if you just waited for spontaneous pregnancy. And we're seeing increasing um, reasons to believe that there is actually harm in the long term. So I think that that could drive clinical decision uh, in an un unexplained unfertile, uh, subfertile couple to postpone treatment for a longer period. Well, we go on to room two, she's uh, Mrs. V. She's a first time pregnancy, 28 years, 31 weeks and a day. And she has severe preeclampsia. She had been administered corticosteroids four days ago um, to um, increase the uh, fetal uh, lung ripening. And she's now got sicker and she has multi-drug therapy. She's on anti-hypertensive anti and magnesium sulfate. And she's pregnant with a growth-restricted baby. And we've suggested that we do a C-section. Um, and she's asking, is the baby going to be OK? Um, well, what do we know about preeclampsia in offspring? We know that over the most of the studies that have looked at uh, the offspring of preeclamptic women, that they have consistently higher blood pressures. There is evidence from David's own work that, and uh, Johan's work that there is more stroke among the offspring of um, preeclamptic mothers. And uh, the one study that's tried to untangle whether these are um, causal effects and did a sibling study found that there, there seemed to be evidence for a causal um, effect of preeclampsia in pregnancy on cardiovascular measures in the offspring. And we know that um, there are very few things that we can administer to prevent preeclampsia. We have some evidence that calcium may ameliorate uh, the risk of gestational hypertension. Interestingly, those studies have also uh, followed the offspring and found that hypertension um, is, uh, or that the blood pressure of offspring that of mothers that had calcium administered were uh, lower. And then um, what we frequently in Holland would administer to women at high risk of uh, gestational hypertension would be aspirin and has a small effect on the reducing the risk of preeclampsia in the subsequent pregnancy. We're very strict in Holland in the group of women that we administer it to in, in contrast to here. In the UK, women are quite broadly administered aspirin as a preeclampsia pre uh, prevention measure. Um, we have no idea whether aspirin might also ameliorate the risks in the offspring of hypertension um, and we actually don't know what the long-term outcomes for mother are, mothers that have had aspirin are either. So I think there's uh, room for um, research and um, possibly might, if you could find an effect to the benefit of the offspring of mothers that had had aspirin, um, that might be um, supportive of a more liberal aspirin administration um, regimen. Oops, we go up again too quick. Now I need to go back one. There we go. So, um, next room. <laughs> We're in a hurry this morning. Mrs. B, uh, first time pregnancy. She's 37 weeks in a day pregnant. Uh, she's pregnant with twins, uh, and the first one's presenting in breach. She's developed term preeclampsia. And uh, she's opted for an elective caesarean. We want to perform the caesarean 
in, in a relatively short um, time space because of the preeclampsia. And we know that delivering a baby before 39 weeks per cesarean is, um, is, in, is um, associated with an increased risk of um, respiratory problems with the baby, including uh, admission to the neonatal ward with, um, with uh, wet lung and IRDS. The question is whether we should administer corticosteroids to um, reduce this risk. Um, we have one trial from Wales uh, published in the BMJ in 2005, which has shown that you reduce the risk, of an, um, the risk of admission to the neonatal ward if you administer corticosteroids in this type of situation. Uh, it lowers the very small risk of IRDS that is about 1% uh, to 0.2%. Um, uh, it doesn't lower the total number of admissions to the neonatal intensive care unit. Uh, the study that, uh, that was performed in Wales did not include any twins and it also didn't include uh, women with endocrine or um, hypertensive disease and uh, we're talking about a large number of women because we're doing more and more caesareans and we're broadening our um, elective caesarean indication um, so uh, I think it's something we need to know but um, we also need to know what this small benefit in the short term is linked to in the long term. Well, the same group has done a long-term a long follow-up at school age of the children in the trial, and um, they found no differences uh, between children that had been administered betamethasone versus control children in lots of the um, hyperactivity, emotional conduct scales. But what they did uh, find is um, a, a doubling of the chance that children in the beta-methasone group uh, would have of being um, considered in the lower quart quartile of academic ability by their teachers in school. And I think that's a considerable um, worry. I, I know that the NICE guidelines in the UK um, uh, suggest that you should administer corticosteroids to reduce the risk of uh, neonatal uh, respiratory problems, um, but I would question whether uh, parents, if parents knew about the long-term outcomes, whether they would opt. I, don't, I know as a mum, I would not opt for um, a high chance of my kid being in the lowest quartile of academic ability. Um, I don't think the two weigh up. So that's an area where I think parents need to know about the long-term outcomes and it can drive the clinical decision. So I don't get to go to room four because I'm beeped up to the, um, down to the ER where there's um, Mrs. M who's uh, 32 years old. It's her second pregnancy, she's eight weeks pregnant. Any resemblance to any of the royal family is totally um, coincidental. She has a history of hyperemesis gravidarum in the first pregnancy. She's vomiting, she has experienced weight loss. She was 55 kilos, she's now 53 kilos. She's not responding to antiemetics. There are no electrolyte disturbances and she has ketonuria and she's requesting that something be done. Could she be admitted? Could she at least be treated? And how, how would we best man manage her? Um, well, Based on my um, background in, in the Dutch famine, I think the, where we saw the majority of the effects um, in the group of men and women that were um, uh, exposed to famine in very early gestation, I find women with hyperemesis gravidarum very, very similar to the group of, of women that were uh, pregnant early on and conceived during the famine. Uh, they have weight loss, they have low intake. We have a study from um, South Africa that shows that intake is about 800 calories a day in women with hyperemesis gravidarum. It's very, very similar to the Dutch famine intake. We don't have any evidence-based treatment for hyperemesis. It's usually self-limiting. Doctors find it very uninteresting and they find patients with hyperemesis um, uh, uh, problematic because they keep coming back and they keep wanting treatment. We don't have anything to offer them. Um, we know that hyperemesis patients have more frequently uh, have poor perinatal outcomes, so they have more low birth weight babies, they have more premature deliveries, um, and uh, we know a little bit about the offspring. There's only two studies that have looked at this. 
we know that they have decreased insulin sensitivity and higher blood pressure in childhood. So how to manage? What we usually would do is give them some uh, uh, rehydration, intravenous rehydration, so a drip with some salt water and send them home again. Or should we be feeding them? I, um, I th uh, based on my background in the Dutch famine study, I've dis we've uh, recently um, started a, a randomized control trial where we start uh, feeding women by nasogastric tube and we've randomized them to our usual treatment, which is rehydration. And um, we're hoping to know whether in the short term this has any benefits. And if it has no benefits in the short term, we are very interested to see if we can um, uh, change the effects on insulin sensitivity and blood pressure in the offspring. So again, another example of where clinical decision making and research is affected by um, the background of David's ideas. Anyway, the nurse comes and get me from, gets me from the ER because it's, in her um, opinion, it's time for a coffee break and the nurse is uh, herself pregnant. It's all going very well and I say, well, would you like a cup of coffee too, nurse? And she says, no, I'm not having coffee because it might harm the baby, but I will have a hot chocolate and a donut. <laughs> And uh, thank you. So um, we uh, sit down and she has her hot chocolate and donut and I have my black cup of coffee. And um, brings me to think about the healthy nutrition in pregnancy and in pre-pregnancy. We have national guidelines on, uh, on this and they are very different per country. Um, our Dutch guidelines are very extensive and include recommendations on things like rhubarb, cinnamon, um, nutmeg, sassafras, and a number of things you probably have never heard of. Um, some, some of these recommendations, I'd say on folic acid, we have a lot of evidence that there is um, a benefit for women in the preconception and, and post-conception time for using uh, folic acid. And a number of the other recommendations have absolutely no evidence-based evidence, evidence base. So that is an area that we need to look at. And I don't know if we have any guidelines on donuts and hot chocolate in pregnancy, but um, I'd definitely be very interested in that. So what I hope to have shown you now, this is just a, a few patients from my ward round because I only had um, 15 minutes to talk to you. Um, but I, the topics that I've covered are safety and effectiveness of artificial reproductive technology versus natural conception prevention of preeclampsia, antenatal corticosteroids, the management of hyperemesis gravidarum, and what is healthy nutrition in pregnancy. All of these things affect um, the way uh, patients could be managed and the way they could be provided information. And um, in conclusion, uh, I think David's ideas have, uh, and the developmental origins of adult disease are, they're relevant for each and every patient on my ward. They can drive clinical decision making and they are driving the research agenda also in the clinical realm. This is illustrated by the fact that we're now um, uh, trying to organize a, um, um, a structure in which all of the randomized controlled trials in which we investigate interventions in pregnancy and before pregnancy where th those trials are provided with a long-term perspective where we're going to be studying the children and even if in trials there is no effect in the short term we can possibly by studying the long term um, be informed about a, a benefit or a harm and thank you very much for your attention